Welcome to Transformative Principle. I'm your host, Jethro Jones, and you can follow me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. This episode is brought to you by John Cat Educational, a professional development publisher serving as the global leader in combining both research and practice in all materials. Find timely PD publications to support yourself and your faculty by visiting them online at us.johncatbookshop.com. Great instruction gets students engaged. TeachFX equips teachers with the instructional strategies and job-embedded feedback they need to get students engaged in virtual or in-person classes. Learn more about TeachFX and get a special offer at teachfx.com slash transformative principle. Welcome to Transformative Principle. I am super excited to have Ira Sokol on the program today. I've been following Mm -hmm. Ira on Twitter at Ira Sokol, I-R-A-S-O-C-O-L, and I suggest you do the same. He's a former technology director and a special education teacher, and he's also been a police officer with NYPD, and he's uh, also the author of the t- of Timeless Learning and the Drool Broom. Oh, that was kind of tough to get through, Ira. Sorry about that. <laughs> Welcome to Transformative Principle. I'm excited to have you. It's great to be here. I'm, I'm thrilled that we're finally getting a chance to talk. Yeah, it's always fascinating to me when I follow people on Twitter and get to know them and feel like I do know them. And you're somebody that I've been following for a long time. And I just really appreciate the way that you approach problems, approach situations. And there are things that I don't agree with you about. And and I think that that is uh, fantastic because it's not about agreeing. It's about having that that good conversation. However, most of your education topics I do agree with. And so let's let's start talking about that. One of the things I think that we both agree on is that we need some change to happen in our education system. And you wrote a very long post on Medium about, I think the title was, how can you give grades when you know giving grades is wrong or something along those lines. And I remember reading that and thinking that that is very, very true. So let's talk about the change that we need to have in schools and why we need to have some energy around it. For myself, the the driver of change is simply in where we want our children to get to, what we want them to be, versus where they currently end up with, <laughs> where end up at. We're not accomplishing what 99% of us would hope to accomplish, which is that our kids would grow up to be happy, productive good in their families, good in their community, good in their citizenship, good in their whatever work they want to be. I often phrase it this way, that we need to judge our work by how many choices our students have when they turn 30. If if we have done our job, they will be able to choose where to live, where to work, uh, et cetera. And if we haven't, they will often be stuck, which is where lots and lots of, of Americans end up right now. And I think it's because we focus on all the wrong things in education. We focus on content acquisition when really content acquisition has always been secondary to what school is about. School is about learning together, learning to be a community, learning to work with your peers, learning about the world, yes, but not learning about trivial facts, which is what we usually measure. It's also can't be about compliance because when we train kids in compliance, which is what the bulk of the school day is about, we're not teaching them to think for themselves or we're not teaching them the wonder of intrinsic motivation. Uh, Intrinsic motivation is what drives the world forward. It's this wonderful thing where curiosity pushes you into new fields, into new discoveries, uh, into new self-awareness. And we take all that away from students. One of the things, you know, I've often said is that kids learn at this exponential rate. 
zero to five. They get to school and it all slows down to a grind. And we start using terms like my, my current favorite during the pandemic is, you know, kids are falling behind. Well, behind what? <laughs> you know, and also this bizarre assumption that the only place learning happens is school. When I watch kids learning all sorts of things not being in school right now. And I've always watched that throughout my entire life. I, I think the critical thing is, is to accept the fact that childhood and adolescence are these wonderful, incredibly developmental periods of life. And we need to do a great job of leveraging all that is to help our kids become all they can be. The, teacher who I always describe as saving my life. He completely changed an alternative high school that, that I went to into a school without walls. And, and he described it as the judo principle of education. You take whatever a kid is passionate about and you use it to flip it to uh, everyone's advantage. I've been through a lot of different educational systems. I've been through, you know, a school without walls, um, I've been to a college experience that had no grades. I've been through the New York City Police Academy, which had grades, but viewed it in a very sort of unique way and, and also viewed the fact that any failure was this sort of really negative mark against the organization. I've been through grad school. I've been through all these things, and I've seen that there are options, there are different choices we could make. And I've also seen that in international work. So I think we need to make changes. There's an urgency of, to change also because our kids are only this age once and every year we wait, we lose another cohort of kids. Yeah, that, that urgency piece I think is, is so important. So when I was principal of middle school, we had this approach. Every year, there are two grades. So every year, more than 50% of our students are going to be brand new to our school and are going to have no idea what anything was like before. So this excuse of that's the way we've always done it doesn't really apply because nobody's going to know besides you. And you can move on and, and figure things out. So we've got to do things uh, for the kids that are coming to us, not for you know any anybody else, not for the kids that were there 20 years ago because we started it with them. We've got to just continue it. That's just not that's just not doing right by our kids. A, a few minutes ago, you mentioned this idea of we need to judge our work by how many choices kids have when they are 30. And a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, I interviewed the founding principal of the Greater Dayton School. AJ Stick. So they have a thing there where they say they want to track their kids until oh. they're 27 and and they want at least 80% of them to be successful by their own definition, physically and mentally healthy, living lives of character and integrity, financially independent and established in a career. And those five areas they want to measure until kids are 27 and this is just a K8 school. And so for us to keep track of kids after they graduate high school is a challenge for us in a regular system. This school is seeking to do that until they turn 27. And I'm not sure why they chose the age of 27, but like you, 30 years old, that's a pretty close area where if if we're judging our success based on what they can do then, then we can feel pretty confident. And if they're at that point getting those five things, then then we can probably all agree that that was successful. So the problem, though, is that we don't measure kids that long and we don't know what they're doing. And none of those things that I listed uh, or that you think we should measure kids on, I think, are things that we can measure effectively while the kids are in school with what we're currently doing. So we need to come up with different ways of measuring what success looks like as the kids are at a young age. So if those are the kinds of things that we're looking for, what you suggested and what um, AJ uh, talked about with the Greater Dayton School, what should we be measuring right now? And what should we be focusing on right now when the kids are young and in our schools? I fully believe that we have measurable things. I, I also know that when we do track kids further on, 
we discover things that should really disturb us after 30 years of focusing on college readiness. 50% of kids who go to colleges don't go back for the second year. So we failed on by our own measurements um, when we look ahead. But there are key things that I think we've forgotten as humans. Human beings have been assessing how kids are doing for millions of years. And for millions of years, they did it without anybody taking a standardized test or anybody getting a grade. We have our politicians and leaders have the educational industry has worked very hard to convince educators over these past 30 years that they can't evaluate anything unless there's a standardized test associated with it. I say to teachers who object to a kid missing a test, I say, do they know it? They say, either, I say, either say yes or no. I said, then what is the test for if you know what's going on? So I, I think, though, in our buildings, we need to look for some very specific evidence. And if we watch this among kids, and you know, where I worked in Virginia, we had up to 2,000 kid high schools, 700 kid elementary schools. We had big schools. So we weren't working in this sort of wonderful little fairyland or anything. But we looked for certain qualities and kids doing certain things. It's it's kind of funny, but step one for me is always, are you understanding what our responsibilities are in a school, in a culture, in a society? And one of the things that makes me happiest and also proves where kids are is when you see kids having a maximum level of freedom. Somebody asked me once after touring schools with me, said, tell me, what are your metrics? And I said, well, the first thing I do upon walking into a school is to look to see how many kids are out in the halls during class time. And the person said, what? And I said, well, if kids are out in the halls, it means that the Adults in the building trust those kids to do what they have to do and go where they need to go. And if the doors are all locked down, I assume that it's proof that nobody gets trusted. And I've never seen learning happen in a situation where kids didn't trust adults. And kids never trust adults unless adults trust them. So you look for these things first. And one story that I've I've told a number of times, but it meant a lot to me. When we first developed our first big multi-age elementary space, which, so a room that had 125 kids or so and six teachers, K through five, all in one place. And there was a group of superintendents from Pennsylvania visiting to look at this, um, a, a place where you never heard adult voices. I mean, they were talking to individual kids or two or three at a time, but you never really heard instructions or things like that. And at one point, these three kids, I think they were third and fourth graders, are walking out the door to the outside. And the superintendent says to one of the teachers, do you know where they're going? And his response was, no, but I'm pretty sure they do. He has done the assessments that's necessary to know these kids can go where they need to go and do what they want to do. And when we saw that environment, we watched virtually every kid get all their work done, even though there were no specific deadlines, no specific things, simply because they had built a culture where kids work together to do that you know, across things. And in another version, and so slightly well, I'll avoid some of the language, but in a middle school mechatronics class, which was our combination of shop and, and high tech stuff, there were two teams of kids working sort of back to back and different things. And these were sixth graders. And one of the kids on one team turned around and said to the kids on the other team, you guys better get to work. You haven't done blank all week. <laughs> And I thought, again, 
this is what we're looking for. We're also looking for them to learn to be better communicators, which there's a million ways to assess. You know, one of our favorite stories is when a middle school chose to build rolling tree houses in their cafeteria, which was probably the best assessment of math skills I've ever seen. And I think if we think about the way that humans do this, how you know whether a kid is is doing okay on a human level, combined with helping kids learn to say, last week I couldn't do this, but this week I can. That's what moves us forward. Because what I don't think is interesting, although obviously the, the feds and every state loves this, is the memorization of trivia that will be forgotten within 15 minutes of the test being over. That's worthless. And I do think it's a confidence thing. I do think it's that we can help our teachers and our principals, all our administrators get to a place where they can say confidently, I know this kid is doing well. And that's where portfolios, et cetera, come in as a really healthy alternative to grades, you know, in any form. We've taken a little experimentation with our kids this year, our own children, by having them do some unschooling and and learning things on their own and not having a teacher to say, this is what you have to do next. And we've done similar types of things to what you're talking about in the schools that I've worked in before. And it's just, it continues to amaze me how much kids can accomplish when that trust is there. Because when they believe that you trust them to make their own decisions, the things they do are are just incredible. And it's mind blowing because you wouldn't expect someone to do that. So over Thanksgiving break, my daughter, who's only nine, Um, wanted to do a girl's night with her sisters and they wouldn't get on board with it. And for whatever reason, they said, we don't want to do that. And she's the youngest. So you know how the youngest did now she's upset that nobody wants to do anything. And so instead what she did is she, she was complaining to my wife about it. And my wife said, well, why don't you make an invitation and make it so that like, it's clear what's happening, you know, and you can talk about ideas that you can do together and things like that. And so she took that and she ran with it. And it was amazing because it was just a suggestion to find a way to resolve this problem. So instead of just doing that, she said, well, we're going to have a Thanksgiving family party. And we, <laughs> they all, she like made this elaborate invitation that listed everybody who was coming when it was happening, what we were going to do. She made up a game called pin the pilgrim on America, and then did all this stuff to organize it. And you said something about, you know, we're not teaching the wonder of intrinsic motivation. Well, she really wanted to have a party. And so she went above and beyond to make that happen, planned a fun activity for us to do a bunch of different things. And she did it all on her own without anybody saying, this is what you have to do. She wanted it. She figured out how to make it work. And then we had ended up having a great time. And if we would have said, make a party specifically, then she would have kept coming back to us and saying, what should I do? What should I do? We didn't have to do that. She knew we trusted her to take care of that part. And so that's what she did. And she made this awesome experience for us. And if we had been focused on, you know, in order to make a party, you have to master these four standards, you know, it would have been a nightmare. It wouldn't have been fun for anybody, but because we approached it in a way that empowered her to make the decisions, we had a great experience and a fun opportunity. And it was much better than what we were going to do for Thanksgiving that night, which was just, just a great thing for her to be in charge and her to experience what that looks like. And for her to be a trusted member of the rest of the family. This is a win that will pay dividends forever. You know, and I think that's the key thing. Let me tell you these two two stories very quickly that I, I just think illustrate what happens when you create this openness in these pathways. We had a young man who I first met during sixth grade when there was some accusation of arson. I thought it was just an experiment gone bad, but that's my view of things. He failed 
essentially every class in sixth grade. And so he came back to summer school and thankfully we had changed summer school into maker camps. Um, we had done it to all our elementaries and that year we had done it to all our middle schools as well. And so the only question was when he came in the door was, what do you want to make? And he said, I don't want to make anything. I want to get out of here. <laughs> and the teacher said, well, what do you want to go do? He didn't say you can't leave. He said, what do you want to go do? He said, I want to go play baseball. It's the only thing I want to do. And so the teacher said, really, what position do you play? He said, I'm a catcher. And the teacher asked the great question. He said, tell me, is there a problem that you have in baseball that you'd like to solve? And this young man said, yeah, pitchers think they're throwing strikes and they're not. Have, having been a catcher many years ago, I appreciate this thing. In three weeks, this kid who could not pass sixth grade math had built an Arduino powered laser grid that spotted um, pitch position. The next fall, he we had a startup weekend for educational stuff, not for kids. This was for adults. You know, we had people come from the Norfolk Naval Base. We had people from Washington all over the place. This young man came and pitched his idea. And his idea didn't get selected in the first round. And he said, I don't care. I'm going to work on it anyway. And there was a naval engineer who said, huh, I don't know, I'm going to stick with this kid. At the end of the weekend, he won the weekend for having the most viable product and, you know, got links to a venture capital firm he's working with. Now, what I always say about him is that he still cannot sit in the classroom. Actually, he just graduated this past year, never being able to actually sit in a classroom. To which I say, that's our problem, not his problem. Because he might be one of the most brilliant people I've ever seen. And this was hidden under all sorts of compliance problems that he had because he's a bouncing kid. In another case, we had a young man come to us uh, for what should have been his senior year in high school. He had been sent from Brooklyn by his mother to live with his grandmother because he had just gotten out of juvenile detention in Brooklyn. He arrived with not enough credits to be a 10th grader. He walked into the school and we had just, in what I call our small bets, one of the things we did was open music construction studios in our secondary libraries, places where kids could record stuff and, you know, mix stuff up and sample and do all these things. They really were not expensive things to do. We had just opened the one in this high school. And Coleon, and, you know, we have some of his lyrics in, in Timeless Learning, Coleon walks into the library, sees this, and suddenly connects. This is his passion. This is what he wants to do. He connects with all these different kids. And very quickly, he's at school from 7 in the morning when we began at 9 till we kick him out at 6 in the evening or 7. And suddenly it's really important to him to not just do well in school with the music, but to graduate with his now cohort. I've never seen anyone do credit recovery so much, work so hard in classes. This kid worked his butt off and graduated on time with, with his class in, in a, now in Virginia, you don't graduate without passing eight high school state tests. He accomplished all that. When we reached back out to him to see if we could use some of his stuff in the book, you know, I always say, Colin's not a magic kid, but he was working two jobs in restaurants, taking a couple of classes at the community college in a very stable live-in relationship with a young woman. What more could I hope for, you know, than this guy? He was happy. He was okay. He was happy. He was living his life. Both of those things became possible because we didn't define kids by any deficit and by the fact that we opened up every conceivable path we could to help kids find their own way. 
I just want to say, you know, we were not working in this magic place. We had really high poverty, really high income inequality. We had a very, very diverse population. We served an international refugee center. Um, and, and we had <laughs> the medium amount of money per pupil that American schools have. So we didn't have a lot, but we didn't have a little. But we could figure out how to do things to change the culture around the school so that it wasn't just a top-down push to say, we have to open these opportunities for kids. John Cat Educational supports high quality teaching and learning by providing publications that are research based, practical, and focused on the key topics proven essential in today's and tomorrow's schools. The latest John Cat publications include a book whose bold, transformative ideas amaze and infuriate people around the world, according to one reviewer, a title from Global Leaders in Curriculum Planning, Practice, and Retrieval, one book that says stop talking and start doing with regard to teacher well being, and much more. These books, used by educators of all roles across North America and worldwide, amplify fresh, engaging voices with practical strategies to create transformative change. Learn more in our show notes at jethrojones.com slash podcast. During COVID, every teacher is a new teacher. That's why innovative school leaders are turning to TeachFX, whose professional learning platform doubles student engagement online or in person. To learn more about TeachFX and get a special offer, visit teachfx.com slash transformative principle. I created a new podcast with my friend Frederick Lane called Cybertraps. We are exploring the myriad risks and adverse consequences that can arise from the use and misuse of digital devices and electronic communication tools. Please subscribe to the Cybertraps podcast, and if you like it, please give us a rating. Here's an excerpt from an interview with Eric Stevens on the value of identity and being ethical in our work with underserved populations. If I approach my research with the intention of helping a group of people, but I am using the data that they themselves have created and have been replicated by their, their own personal identity, replicated over and over and over and over my research is already flawed ethically. Some people, that's not a big thing. For me, it was problematic because I didn't want to feel like I was exploiting people, but I still wanted to help. What I ended up creating was I wanted to understand the prison system at the language level across time, um, and across space in the United States. Um, basically, I wanted to understand if we send a person to prison, we're sending them to a correctional facility um, with correctional officers. And we give them handbooks to say, hey, this is what you should be doing. What I wanted to answer was at the language level with the technical documents that we hand to um, an inmate, what are we correcting them to? To what standard are we asking them to be at the language level? Check out more from this interview at cybertraps.com slash seven. The things that Ira is talking about in this episode are the things that I've done in my schools. It is powerful change to see that happening in person. This is the kind of thing that I help principals accomplish as part of my transformative mastermind. If you want to get there, you can certainly do it by yourself. If you want to get there faster and better by learning from other principals, join us in the mastermind. Go to jethrojones.com slash mastermind and fill out the application. I'd love to have you join our cohort. We saw teachers all over begin doing this and embracing children. One of my favorite things was that our, our intervention teachers and our gifted teachers merged their programs into what they call talent development. So they just worked with every kid and saw what every kid needed and did. 
that was all them. They just looked at the kids and decided this, this is what we're doing. We can change things. It's not that I want to quote our 97% on-time graduation rate. That will impress people, but it doesn't mean anything because it doesn't mean anything if they're not able to take what they learned to someplace and go. But we found consistently that we allowed our kids to find ways to succeed driven by what mattered to them, not what mattered to us, not even necessarily what mattered to their parents. Like I had a little issue some brought up to me by a father whose daughter decided to drop out of AP classes to be to study construction because she enjoyed building a tiny house. <laughs> but that's where she wanted to go and she's successful at it. Well, and that that is the the quote unquote dark side of students choosing their own thing is that they're not going to choose always what their parents want them to choose. And I think what's so important about that is that it, it honors who the kids are and the skills that they have rather than them buying into the narrative of whatever their parents want for them. And, you know, I was working with a high school student last summer who was trying to decide what he wanted to do. And he was saying, you know, I really like doing this one thing over here, but I know that I've got to go to school and be successful in this area. And so, you know, I basically have to choose between going to to, uh, college and getting into a really quote unquote good college, whatever that means, and doing the thing that I really love and want to do. And I said, well, that's just a decision that you have to make. And he eventually said, I just need to do what my parents want me to do. And so instead of choosing something that's going to make him feel fulfilled, he's doing what's making his parents feel fulfilled. And and at some point, he's going to realize that that isn't enough for him, and he's going to go back and do that other thing. What I love about that story with that girl is that she realized that in high school and was able to drop those AP courses that uh, truly she doesn't need and was able to pursue something that was more interesting to her. And furthermore, not only did you have that opportunity for her to choose what she wanted, you also had the opportunity for her to take AP courses if that's what she wanted as well. And so with all this stuff, I mean, it it makes us do things differently in education. Why don't more people do it, Ira, when, when we can see how plainly it works for so many kids? You know, what you're saying is, is this really important thing? I'm, I got this harsh lesson very early in my K-12 education career when I had a young man and he was a soccer player and um, soccer's always been a big sport sort of for me. And we spent a lot of time together and he was from the middle class part of the edge community. He was an incredible goalkeeper and he was offered a scholarship by Duke which his parents were over the moon about. In fact, his father took him out one day and got a Blue Devil tattoo for him. (laughs) Um, But he didn't want to go to Duke. He had no interest in going to Duke. And so he drank antifreeze. I thought that was my first lesson in, I didn't grow up with money. That was my first lesson in that parents of all kinds can do damage to kids through misdirected expectations. And so I think it's as much as it's a battle to help parents learn that the best thing they can do for their kids is let their kids be who they are. It's, it's a battle absolutely worth, worth fighting. I think your thing about why it doesn't happen often. And when I was teaching at Michigan State, I had this wonderful teaching assistant who said, all across America, there's a teacher doing something on one side of the hall that the teacher on the other side of the hall says is impossible. And I, I thought this is really true. And and because in our school district in Virginia, we we got a lot of attention, a lot of people came to visit us. And in many cases, you could hear them start spinning the excuses from the moment they arrived. 
well, this is like this, and it just doesn't look like my school, and this doesn't look like this and this. I don't know how to make people more courageous. It's a hard battle. I don't know whether in my life I've been create courageous or just foolish, but um, one or the other. And I've always believed it was worth it was worth the fight at every situation. It was worth the risk. What I try to tell people is your expectations of risk are so overinflated. One of the things that I saw is when we did that multi-age space and we that first woman was in a school that spoke 61 languages that had all sorts of real challenges to it. The kids in that room matched the wealthiest kids in the county on the state test at the end of the year, even though there had been no explicit instruction whatsoever. And in fact, in one case, the prep for the fourth graders involved telling them that morning they had to take the test. <laughs> that was it. But because they were learners in that room, they did fine. What, what I've seen across the board is that when you take these risks, kids live up to your expectations, it, just as they will live down to them. And they will find a way. And I learned that in my high school. We we did the strangest things for credits, but we still had to take the New York State Regents test at the end of the year. And somehow a whole bunch of alternative school kids who didn't cover necessarily 20% of the content, as it were, managed to pass those tests all the time. We have said to people, you're expecting the worst, but really, what do you have to lose? And my ultimate example of that was the middle school kids who built rolling tree houses in the cafeteria. And they did that in the three weeks leading up to the state testing window in a middle school that had never gotten accredited in math. Um, and basically, my pitch to the principal was, what do you got to lose? What do you got to lose? That's a great question. What do you got to lose? And you know what? By spending all their time before the test building things and dealing with actual mathematical reasoning, they passed. They not only passed, they beat the state average. You now, again, I just encourage people to say, take the chance, you know, understand that it's not always going to work out. It doesn't, nothing we never have 100% success. But if we keep changing, we keep iterating what we're doing, we get better and better and better at it. What Pam Moran and I do now, she was the superintendent for me who dragged me down from Michigan, a very persuasive woman. And what we do now is we work with sort of school districts around the country is we try to say to them, you can take these chances. If you need us to hold your hand, we'll hold your hand. Because that's what I did with principals. You know, I would say, all right, I'll be here. I'll be standing here. I didn't do much in those situations, but I'll be standing there. If you need us to do that, but you probably don't. Most places don't need us to be there. They just need to take the risk and leap forward. And what we asked our teachers to do and one of the things we switched was we changed our teacher appraisal process to one where we weren't trying to rank them on their teaching. We made a developmental model. So we said, how are you changing? What are you doing that's different? All we ask is that they take a little leap each time, you know, from wherever they were and, and go forward. And slowly that builds that really gets you someplace. Well, and it, you don't have to take these huge, gigantic steps and completely transform your school just like that. But it's possible to do that. And and I've certainly done that as a principal. Uh, One of the challenges that I saw was that if you have kids in a teacher's classroom and it's called that particular content, then the teachers feel obligated to do that particular content. So if you have kids in a math class and say, you know, this is genius hour time, 
they're they're still going to do something related to math because the teachers can't handle it. And so what we did is we created unstructured time that was not tied to any content area for an hour and a half, two times a week where kids could go and do what they wanted to do. And my favorite story, which people who are listening to this are probably like, here he goes again. But these girls want to teach other girls how middle school girls want to teach elementary school girls how to do uh, cheer, soccer and volleyball. And so they had to figure out how to make all that work and how to do it in the time frame and how to do it in negative 40 degree weather where they would bring the kids over from another school. They had to get permission for that. They went through all this stuff to figure it out. And they had, instead of having an actual teacher there to help them, they went through four different substitutes during that time to get this set up until we finally hired a long-term substitute who by the time he came in was just like, okay, this is what you're doing, whatever. I'll just be here and make sure nobody gets hurt. It really was his job. And because they did everything themselves. And so they figured out how to do all this. And the best part was, is they said, we want to open this up to more kids. We want to have boys come over and we want to have boys teach them. And I said, girls, this is a bad idea. The boys that you want to have teach them have not put in the work that you have and they are going to ruin what you have created. And they said, that's okay. We're going to do it anyway. We still want the boys to be involved. So they did. So two weeks later, they came to me and said, so we hired these boys. How do we fire people and still maintain a sense of dignity and help them like not feel like their life is over? And for these girls to recognize that they needed to get these boys out of their group because they were not helping was amazing. Nowhere in our standards does it say that kids need to know how to fire someone, but these girls knew instinctively that they needed to and that they need to do it in a way that they that maintained the grace and compassion that they already had and made sure that the boys didn't feel like they they were horrible people because they got fired from this group. I mean, the things they learned were just mind-boggling because they were so far ahead of where we thought uh, a middle school girl should be. And they did this on their own. They didn't have the support of a good teacher there holding their hand the whole time because they went through four different substitutes because we couldn't find a teacher to teach the group that they randomly got assigned to. And I think that was actually for the better because they couldn't go to the same person and say, how do we do this? They had to figure it out on their own and nobody was holding their hand. And it was just an amazing, amazing story that I just, I I will tell that story as much as I can till the day I die, because it's so inspiring to see what these girls did. You know, what you're talking about is what I usually frame as is what do we want our children to be? Um, and if you can answer that question, one of the advantages I had when I came down to the District of Virginia was that eight years before they had written what they called their lifelong learning competencies, 12 things that they thought every kid who left the school system should have with them, you know, the ability to do research, whether it was buying a car or something else, the ability to work with others, the ability to communicate well, the ability to be creative and empathetic, you know, this you know, whole list of things. And that allowed us to make decisions based on were we moving our kids toward this or not. So what you have just talked about is what do you want your kids to be, the ability to fire people well. One of the stories, and people will say this about me, there you go again, that I tell a lot is being in a classroom in Ireland, um, and the Irish schools don't divide kids up pre-K through grade six. They have them all together. They believe in that as a basic driving concept. So there was, he said to the teacher, would it be easier if you were teaching all eight-year-olds? And she said, I don't understand. If everyone in the room was eight, how would anyone learn to be nine? And then there was a mother in the room, and we said, you think your son would be doing better if, you know, it was all eight-year-olds. He was eight also. And she said, oh, but then how would he learn to care for the wee ones? What they were describing is they wanted their kids to be mentors and they wanted their kids to be em empathetic and caregivers. I said, boy, I don't think I get these answers in America, which made me think about that whole definition of what we want our, our children 
to become. And we had a similar thing with high school girls who decided to run a, a bridge building camp for middle school girls, which is a remarkable thing. What they've learned proves they can learn anything they need to learn as they go forward. And because we have no idea what kids will need to know in the future, I think we should be a lot more open about that. One of the things I point out to educators a lot is kids who entered kindergarten this year are predicted by demographic studies that they will live to 2115. We have kids in our schools now who are gonna spend a significant chunk of their lives in the 22nd century, and half our schools are still talking about getting to 20th, 21st century learning. We have to admit that we know a lot less than we pretend to, and let kids help to drive that forward. They are amazing at seeing what's coming because it's their world. I talk a lot about technology and, and, and accessibility and stuff, but if I think I've been fighting, because it's a personal thing for me, but fighting the audiobook fight with educators for 30 years, if I would have predicted 20 years ago that half the country would be listening to audiobooks as a routine, People would have laughed at me. Now it's dominant that we'd be dictating to our phones and talking to some Google or Alexa item and having things happen in our house. But kids could jump on that because it all made sense to them. And when we open those opportunities, one of the things I think about a lot is we did a thing each summer called Coder Dojo which was something we picked up in Ireland, sort of a peer-to-peer -peer coding camp, K through 12, all together working on stuff. And we would that put about seven to 900 kids through it each summer. And each year I would watch five-year-olds work comfortably with negative integers and slope intercept after two or three days because in Scratch, they wanted their characters to go backwards or fall. When you open that possibility up, then you say, now they're gonna go into kindergarten and the people are gonna be talking to them about one plus one. <laughs> and we're boring them to death when their skills are so much higher when we just open it up to them. And what was, most wonderful about that was it didn't matter if the kids didn't speak English at all because they're working in a language, a universal language across things. And what I've seen is that we can do so much better for kids and it just takes a little bit of guts on our side. You know, somebody asked me once to lead a thing on fearless conversations. And I said, no, because somebody who's fearless is either uninformed or stupid. But Courage is, do, is knowing the fear, having the fears and still doing it anyway. And we know there are fears. And as you said, you can do big changes, but you can do little changes. You can do big changes in little ways. When we began a high school without classes or classrooms, our most radical thing, it's just a pure passion-based learning high school, we began it with under 30 kids no giant risk there. You know, we built it in the middle of a, a, of a factory warehouse. We rented space and, and put it in there. When, you know, we first tried multi-age, we did one. You know, I always tell people to avoid the Los Angeles iPad thing. Do not do everything at once. Pick something, you know, pick the things you think you can test out and try. Pam Rand's thing is always aim small, miss small. And so that you have the chance to look at what's going on and iterate it and fix things if things aren't going as, as you expected. But, but do something. Do the change. You know, if you're in a building now, go in and turn off your bells. You'll find it doesn't make anybody late. <laughs>
<laughs> no, funny story that actually made our students more on time because what they were doing when we turned off our bells is they were waiting for the bell to tell them they needed to hurry to class. So we just turned them all off. And what we saw was that kids would hang out in the hall for a minute and then they would just go to class because they knew that's where they needed to be next. And we trusted them to get to where they needed to be. And guess what? The kids who were always late before, they were still always late but now they were the only ones and it was much more obvious that they were late because three minutes after uh, the bell rang or after they were dismissed from class, everybody was already in class, but we have five minute passing periods. So kids had more time to take care of whatever they needed to. And the kids who were always late were out in the halls way more often. And that creates its own level of peer pressure, which is what we were talking about at the beginning, where you're creating positive peer pressure that says to kids, why can't you get with the program? You know, why can't you be going along with us? And that doesn't mean kids have to go along with everything all the time. It means that they're learning to function in society as real members of, of a culture and that they learn to respect that culture, they learn to understand it. And people have always asked us, we insisted on all sorts of different seating choices. And we had this line that said, every learner should be able to walk into any learning space and decide where, how, or if to sit. People would say, the kids fight over the couch? Teachers would say, well, I've never seen that. Kids just, after a while, they learn to make themselves comfortable. Part of making themselves comfortable was learning not to make others uncomfortable. And just that little change cut our discipline issues in by more than half because kids were actually sort of comfortable in the classrooms. And we didn't do it with big money. Thankfully, we had the University of Virginia here. So when the kids would move out in May, our teachers would drive around with pickup trucks, grabbing all the furniture off the curb. <laughs> like, so, so let's make this real practical in yeah. closing, Ira. What is one thing you talked about aiming small, missing small, and starting small. What is one thing that a principal can do this week to be a transformative principal? You know, I, I'll give you a, A couple of quick choices, and I I think because I think it um, it matters. One is, yes, turn off the bells. You'll see a change in culture. Um, Secondly, ask your teachers to open their classroom doors and keep them open. So there's a culture of people seeing kids, seeing other kids learning. Um, the, The third thing is a little more challenging, but is incredible at helping the most struggling kids find a way to be respected and a way to succeed. Change your grade book. Yeah, you said change your grade book so nobody can give a failing grade. Is that right? Nobody below a failing grade. It's like I always say it when I've been at colleges with grades, you have a four point scale, but nobody gets a negative 12 or negative 16, which is what zeros do because zeros finish kids off. And when a kid gets a zero, five out of six times, they stop because they can't possibly recover. That little move, which helps kids just stay in there, stay as part of something, um, is, is to me this critical little change. And there will be teachers that, that will complain, but let's talk about the fairness of it. If you have like a three point or a five point teacher evaluation scale, does anyone want to get a negative 20? It just isn't helpful to people. It doesn't make sense. And to me, it just doing that will help teachers start to see kids in a different way because you'll see a lot fewer kids give up on classes. Yeah, that is that is great advice. I really appreciate you being part of Transformative Principal today, Ira. Uh, uh, if you want to learn more from Ira, you can follow him at uh, on Twitter at Ira Sokol. And you can work with him and Pam at um, SokolMoran.com. And once again, Ira, thank you so much for being part of Transformative Principal. It was wonderful to be here, Jethro. Thank you so much.
Thank you to our valued partner, John Cat Educational. If you are a leader looking to make transformative change by providing yourself and your leaders and teachers with professional development that is research-based and rigorous, yet easy to digest and full of practical strategies, check out the latest publications from John Cat. Visit us.johncatbookshop.com to find information on bulk orders or learn much more in our show notes. You can also use the code TRANSFORMATIVE to save a bundle at us.johncatbookshop.com. School principals across the country are using TeachFX's virtual PD and job-embedded feedback to boost student engagement during COVID. With TeachFX, teachers get eight times more feedback and generate 144% more student engagement on average in a school year with no additional work for school leaders or teachers. To learn more about TeachFX and get a special offer, visit teachfx.com slash transformative principal. Hey, middle school principals, what if I told you that all your teachers had to do to teach your students really valuable social and emotional competencies was just press play? In Control SEL is a fully automated video curriculum that teachers and students absolutely love. And that's because it's easy, and it looks just like a Netflix or a YouTube show. So all you have to do to hear about how it can completely transform your school is schedule your call. Tell us Jethro sent you and you'll get 20% off if you feel like it's a good fit. So go now to www.incontrolsel.com slash strategy call to schedule your call today. The link will be in the show notes.